Welcome to the Asking Why podcast. I'm your host, Clint Davis. I'm a marriage and family therapist and licensed professional counselor trained in trauma and addiction. The Asking Why podcast is for anyone on a journey of healing and restoration. If you are searching for answers to life's questions and want to learn more about root causes from a psychological and theological mix, this show is for you. In this podcast, myself and a co-host from Clint Davis Counseling and Integrative Wellness will interview guests on a wide range of topics in order to get down to the heart of the problems facing our world and understand why things happen and how to change the world and ourselves for the better. Want to learn more tips and tricks to living a healthy lifestyle? Visit us at Clint Davis Counseling and Integrative Wellness on Facebook and Instagram. If you want to meet our staff or book a speaker, go to clintdaviscounseling.com. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe today. Hey, Perry. Hi, Clint. I think it's episode six. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about um, kiddos and play therapy. Um, one of the reasons, you know, we were just talking before we started about the importance of this is there's a lot of people who, you know, in our culture are having issues with their kids, whether it's anxiety or depression or trauma or sexually acting out. Um, you know, the, the film Cuties came out recently, and that was kind of a whole big thing in the culture. And so, you know, we just wanted to go through a little bit of what to do about that, what's going on in the world of therapy with kids. I think a lot of people have no clue, you know, what that's like, what sure. what's happening. And, and um, so I just want to give them, you know, some feedback from you. So tell us who you are and uh, what you do. Yeah, so I'm Perry Gilbert Reed, and I am a licensed professional counselor, but I'm also a registered play therapist. So yes, I play for a living. Um, but yeah, registered play or play therapy in general work because it gives psychological distance from the issue that the child is trying to explore. So um, we. Uh, have found or not just we but as the organization of association for play therapy has recognized that you know play is the language toys are the communication so when i have the funnest office in the room in the that's building. right <laughs> definitely the loudest one <laughs> no holding back and by any means no, with my kiddos good. i don't know who's louder them or me but nonetheless that's right uh, well yeah. so explain what psychological distance means for somebody who wouldn't understand what that means sure so psychological distance allows for children if they've had any incident occur i mean just something that they're having difficulty processing we play with toys they may you know pick up a dinosaur and roar at me and just go oh he is bad dinosaur and so then it's the dinosaur that's bad not the child or not the behavior and so the child can work out maybe how he or she is feeling about being yelled at or you know anything like that so the psychological distance we just work with the toys the toys are manifesting those behaviors gotcha. and those kind of things so is that sort of like uh you know i talk a lot with teens when i used to do mst and in home and i'm helping a parent you know kind of make a behavior plan and it's like you get to talk to the child about the behavior plan instead of the parent having to always be the authority. The behavior plans, the rules, we've all agreed on it. And so now it's like, well, the rules say that. Right. So it's mom not having to come in and say, well, I said you had to clean your room. It's like, hey, we agreed that the, mm-hmm. is that kind of the same thing? It's similar, yes. And I think a lot of children come in, you know, they have this authority in that, you know, mom and dad or the authorities in the home, or maybe it's a grandmother, whoever the caregiver is. Mm -hmm. And they feel a sense of responsibility. You know, I can't tell my mom and dad, or I can't say I didn't like X, Y, and Z that mom and dad did. So then it's the dinosaur can say mom and dad did that and he Uh, didn't like it. That's good. Versus, you know, the child saying that and feeling shame or regret or anything like that on it. (laughs) Yeah, that's good. So, um, so part of that psychological distancing, distancing helps helps them alleviate their shame. Would yeah. you say shame, guilt, um, just processing whatever it is they're dealing. I've seen it work wonders with grief. Um, a child loses a father or a mother or just someone important in their life, and so you know we see a lot of things just having to tell a toy good night. Yeah, you know I'll miss you. Things they don't feel like they can say outside of the playroom right and i mean so they're also developmentally not capable of doing that Mm -hmm. so what what age do you see kids like what when can the kid get like play therapy sure i work with ages about two and a half up on there so you know we know trauma can be even pre-verbal um children can act out in their behaviors what they can't say with language and so even a two and a half year old will have some language and we can still work like a behavior 
um, working towards the behaviors versus them having to tell us, by the way, I feel really bad about this. <laughs> There's, right. You know, two, no two and a half or eight year old wants to do that. Right. So, or don't have the language for it. Or don't have the language for it. Exactly. Right. So a lot of times you can be doing play, whether it's sand tray or, and we'll talk about some of those modalities, but you know, you can be doing that. And you as a clinician, who's an adult who does know about emotions and does know what someone's trying to express can pick up on things that the kid doesn't even know they're they're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So what are some of the kind of treatment modalities within play therapy? Like I sure. mentioned sand tray. But. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love me some sand tray. Um, I love working with uh, the kids mm-hmm. to allow them. So sand tray is beautiful because it can be real or imagined. Mm-hmm. So if the kid wants to build a beautiful fort where he's the safest and he's the superhero, then he gets to act out all of that. So right. a lot of times, you know, children feel like they have no choices they feel powerless sometimes helpless but in the playroom they're not they get to be whatever they want to be and so something like sand tray they get to build their universe in their world and involve different people and they get to determine who the winner or who the one that has the power in the in their creation yeah. is um i do art as well of course art is a great medium it could be a scribble on the page but by golly if that person felt good while they were scribbling then that matters you mm-hmm. know um my you know one of the best things you did about this building was you built me a blank wall <laughs> it has no window in it i requested that you gave it and some of the things you know just being able to go outside with a kid and release energy throwing something at that wall that you know can shatter it's just a it's just a good feeling of letting go of any stress or anger and don't worry nobody's hurt in the process yeah. of that but um it it helps so you know whatever i meet the child where the child is so if the child loves art then we're going to do art if the child love it gravitates towards sand tray then we're going to do sand tray you know i work where where they are not just emotionally but also developmentally and in different ways on that yeah i mean i think that's what you're really really amazing i think you know when we first started working together one of the most beautiful pictures of what you do was I was leaving my office and I don't know if you remember this or not, but I'm leaving my office and you and this little girl, um, were doing ballad ballerina, um, breathing. Yeah. Pirouettes I think with like breathing techniques. Mm -hmm. And I walked by and this little nine year old's like twirling and you're twirling. And you know, she was working on her breathing, which, you know, as an adult, we'll sit here and say, Hey, let's work on breathing together. But a kid's not going to do that most Mm -hmm. likely, especially at that age. And I just think that God has definitely gifted you in, in working in that area. I think it's also a great parallel for, you know, Christ teaching on let the children come to me. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I think as adults, we forget how to play. Yes. You know, we get so caught up in being serious and, and getting business done and, and, you know, paying our bills and holding ourselves together. And, and obviously all of our own unrecovered trauma and issues that we forget how to play. Absolutely. You know? And Jesus is very clear of like, there's this part of him that's like, no, keep that innocence, keep that you know, that laughter, keep that joy in what you do. Mm -hmm. And I think you do that really well. And and there needs to be, I mean, a ton more, and we'll get into us doing more about that later. Um, But so I just, I think that's such a beautiful picture of kind of what you do. Thank you. And yeah, I do work, you know, probably the, um, I won't say the saddest, but one of the sad things that I've seen in my room is adults who they have told me, you know, because they've had so much trauma, uh, being able to go, you know, have you ever explored sand tray? You know, because nobody's off holds on plate therapy, you know what I mean? Oh, and for sure. so um, they're like, no, I don't, I don't even know. And when they're doing it, they're like, you know what? I don't even remember playing as a kid. And that's heartbreaking mm-hmm. um, because that shows an insight into into that trauma that they have had. So, you know, play is so important. It's important as a family dynamic yeah. um, as well. So sometimes, you know, even when I'm doing family therapy or helping to repair um, brokenness in a family, we're playing. Because we've got to remember that there is connection in play. And as we grow older and we're distracted by bills and whatever, we forget the necessity that sometimes our kid just wants connection. And that's how they do it, is in their language. And that's a great point, right? Is that, you know, what you're trying to get out of this play is not just, you know, being silly for the sake of silliness, but is finding ways for their age-appropriate, developmentally appropriate to connect, to heal, to Mm -hmm. get words out and and things out that they're not able to do cognitively. And we forget as adults, you know, I mean, I have a three-year-old, or my my wife will say, he's not three yet, so two (laughs) and three quarters and four, you know, five and three-quarter-year-olds. And 
the reality is, is like all we do is play. Mm-hmm. Everything is some kind of game, is some kind of thing. And yeah, it's exhausting some yeah. days. <laughs> uh, but the reality is, is there's so many lessons in the play that we do, you right. know, where we insert boundaries, we insert Jesus, we insert, you know, how do we deal with our emotions? And, and a lot of times, you know, as a parent, we start trying to be logical and use that prefrontal and think that they're going to understand it. Mm-hmm. And they have no clue what's happening. But if you get silly with it or you kind of bring it onto their level, all of a sudden they redirect and then the problem goes away. Yeah, my husband laughs a lot because I, whenever you get me with a group of people and they say, let's play a game, I'm like, no, peace out, I'm going to bed. But you get me with a kid and I'm playing all day long That's because so they remembered how to play. When we get older now, it's who's going to win, you know, or um, it's just games that require too much longer. My brain's off the <laughs> My time it gets there. So, you know, but... No I, settlers of Catan for you, huh? <laughs> None for me. <laughs> not at all. Uh, but by golly, you want to play a game of Pop the Pig? I'm there. I'm right. there. <laughs> okay, so Sand Tray, uh, you know, my experience with Sand Tray was, uh, you know, similar. I had, I think, a therapist at my old job who was like, hey, come in here, let's do Sand Tray. And it was crazy because it was so helpful. I mean you know, the objects that I picked and put out after I did it and laid it all out, you know, and I was just kind of like, I'll just do this to get it, you know, pacifier essentially. And then afterwards I was like, Oh man, it was so emotional. And so like telling of my unconscious, you know, things. And, and then once you start having to say, Oh, well my wife's the tiger protecting my kids from, you know, this sickness and illness that we're going through. And here Mm -hmm. I am as Superman feeling like I have to take over all these things. And here my family is over here on a totally different side of the thing. You know and I'm like? oh, wow, like, I didn't realize that that was all going on. Mm -hmm. But as you externalize it as an adult, you realize, oh, man, there's, you know, so So much much. power in that. Yeah. One of the things that when I'm working with adults, I actually learned it in a um, EMDR for children therapy, but having parts parties. So we celebrate those parts that have kept that child safe a lot of times we look at children and the behaviors that they are manifesting or something that they're bringing to the front that the the parents or the caregivers are like i don't know what to do with that is that normal is that okay and really it appears um like a something that's wrong with them but really it's their brain protecting them Mm -hmm. and so i've had more parts parties with adults and i'm telling you it's a party i have streamers i have balloons i have cake (laughs) (laughs) nine yards and those those adults and i break down those parts of them that have tried so hard to keep them from engaging their trauma, who have protected them when they did endure the trauma, but now they have permission. They they have celebrated those parts, and now they have the permission to tell those parts, you know what, I'm gonna try something different. You can be smaller now, wow. or I don't need you right now, but I thank you for always being there to protect me. And so I work a little bit with kids on that as well, but again, their developmental abilities don't always allow them um, to understand the parts of themselves, but a little bit. Right. You. Can you give me an example of that? Uh, from an adult perspective or a child perspective? Yeah, from the adult perspective. Like when you're talking about like having a parts party, you know, obviously we're care- careful of confidentiality, but just give me a general like so that somebody listening who's like, I don't know what, you know, because we'll get into private parts and all that kind of stuff in a little while. But like, what do you mean? Sure. So um, let's say that Audrey Hepburn, because she's my favorite actress, um, comes to me and needs some therapy. And she and I have been working together for a while. And I noticed that she has several defenses that are up walls that just keep going right and left or she just shuts down. So I may suggest, you know what, let's not be angry at those parts. Let's not, you know, yes, we're going to be frustrated because we want to different outcome but there's a reason that that part of you is there so and a wall would be something like she leaves conversations or she gets angry or she talks back or she Mm -hmm. overeats or she is that what you're saying yes exactly thank you for clarifying that and so then we would go over because i have another section in my room where all the toys and everything are and i allow them to play and so i will tell them i will direct them i want you to find things that represent those parts of you. So I've had people pick up, um, one of the best ones was I have Sky and Paw Patrol and she's in the airplane. Mm-hmm. And so one person, you Helicopter, know. Helicopter, but yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, whatever. <laughs> it flies. <laughs> hey, listen, I'm all in the Paw Patrol right now. So you gotta get it right for those Paw Patrol fans sure. out there. Take here, yeah. take here. <laughs> um, so she pulled a, you know, that Audrey pulled off that thing and said, this allows me to escape whenever I need to. Mm-hmm. 
And I thank her for that because it's kept me from hurting my children or it's kept me from um, feeling un getting out of an unsafe environment. Um, another one might choose um, a Barbie doll compared to the pop the pig, which if you know what Barbie is, you huge. And um, just being able to say, I wish I enjoyed food. But I understand why you think that you have to be this Barbie. Right. And thank you for protecting me as I went throughout high school. But I don't need you as much anymore. So those are when we go through the variety of parts of themselves um, that we go through. And then the, at the conclusion of that, the next session would be, as they think on that, I always have them take a picture of like their sand tray and they think on that and something like that. I would say, you know, as you go through the week, just ask yourself, are you ready to really let go of that part of you? Are mm -hmm. you really ready to give permission to that part to be smaller, to know that it, it, isn't, it did its job well? but now you need something else. And yeah. then we explore that in the following sessions until they can get to that point of going, wow, Yeah, I'm free. that's great. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, some people can get there through talk, talk therapy, sure. you know, but that's a, a great tool to use with people who can't because, you know, sometimes you, you can talk into death, but getting, you know, one of the things I think I love about play therapy, art, EMDR, you know, some of the things that we do here that are trauma related is that, you know, really getting people to get in that right brain and that emotional part that we're yes. so used to having these coping skills that, you know, we disassociate, we disconnect, we check out. And so we're all in this logical brain that mm -hmm. we don't feel it. Mm -hmm. And so we can talk about it or we can cope with it, but we're not really processing that emotional part. And so, you know, through art therapy and I mean, even my own experience in therapy with people with myself, like, man, you can write a letter to somebody and all of a sudden you're boohooing or you're, you know, right. and it's so powerful to be able to get adults and kids specifically into that. Kids are just, I mean, it's just their natural language, you know, their medium. Yeah. And that's what works so well for them. And I'm going to piggyback if that's okay about sure. the brain yeah, um, yeah. on that. So yes, one of the reasons that sand tray works, one of the reasons that EMDR works, um, the reason the two can work together um, along with play therapy even is that it does integrate the right side and the left side of the brain. Of course, when we've had trauma, um, the right side and the left side begin to build a wall between each other. Prior to trauma, it can lean on each other for information, but then the wall builds, and that's where you have extremely logical people who can't go really tap into their emotion, or you have highly emotional people that have difficult difficulty with the rationale pieces of things. And then you have implicit memory, which we know that either if it's a pre-verbal trauma or it's been such a heavy trauma that the brain has done its job by blocking it out, but now it's housed somewhere in the body. Body keeps the score, explains that you know, well, um, but with that implicit memory, it really lives on the unconscious level. So, you know, if you're an adult or a child and maybe, um, something has happened to you, whether it be a sexual assault or you got beat up at school or you got bullied yeah. and somebody touches you by from behind and you jerk, like you're ready to deck them. There may be a reason for that. Your brain isn't recalling under its conscious awareness, but your body does. And so that's housed in that implicit memory. Explicit memory is going to be a lot of where the right brain works. And so it will be able to recall things to consciousness and awareness. And so one of the things with sand trade, play therapy, those kind of things that works is it taps into that implicit memory where we need to bring that to the surface so that it can make a narrative, a coherent story, so that whoever's in the room can process what has happened to them right so what's the uh what's the importance of processing so, you know like you do all that you you get your brain online you get the processing and what's that do i mean you know i know but like sure the person who's listening so neuropathways kind of new habits what does that really yeah mean? so just to kind of give the whole of the brain because it's one of my favorite things the brain is such a fabulous organ so it you know you have the back of the brain and it's got it's a own alarm system back there so it's the limbic system and so the thalamus is your watchtower always scanning for danger danger can be real or perceived and what i mean by that is real is something that's tangible car wreck such cool salt natural disaster perceived is more you're at a restaurant two people are talking they turn and they look at you and they keep talking. What's your response? Personally, mine is come say it to my face. I got issues. <laughs> I know. So um, depending on, on that response, but here's what we need to remember is that a perceived um, issue, and especially in a child's life, 
can be just as real as a real one. Right. And so we always have to look at it from the other person's perspective. If we're a parent, we need to look at it from the child's perspective. Um, and so that thalamus is scanning. Um, it tells once it perceives a threat or sees a threat, it's going to drop adrenaline and cortisol. Um, it keeps you, so those things keep you from throwing up if you need to fight, flat or freeze. Um, cortisol can help us just to freeze. Um, and that tells our, you know, amygdala for fight, flight or freeze. And fight can look like physical or verbal aggression. Fleeing is withdrawal, isolating, hiding, literally fleeing. Um, and then freeze is where it looks like you're there, but you're not there. You're just mm-hmm. kind of checked out. And then the hippocampus campus is attaching feelings to memories and so then when you get into the neural pathways every time we have an experience because neural pathways attach feelings to experiences then a statement is being made so if you are picked up and you are loved when you cry or when you're hungry you develop an attachment or a statement that says you know what i'm loved if you were unsafe and maybe you were picked up for hours at a time you may have something like anxious uh, anxious attachment we know attachment is huge and especially we recognize it in play therapy where zero to three is a critical time for a child to attach to a caregiver and so in that time if um, I know I'm safe, then I'm going to develop that neural pathway. If I'm not, I'm going to develop that neural pathway. So it can neural pathways can be good or bad. Uh, good or bad, I should say, can be either positive or negative mm-hmm. um, because they just are. So it's like could, feelings, right? Yeah, I mean. yeah, just is. Right. So um, you could have a neural pathway that says I'm in control. I have control over me and my emotions. I'm safe right now. But you can also have some that say I have no control or options. I'm powerless. And sometimes you have to hold two choices. And the truth is, you know, using the pandemic as an example is I have no control. You're absolutely right. You have no control over this disease, but you do have control over you and the way that you respond. And so when the back of the brain gets activated, the hippocampus is going, oh, remember the last time you didn't feel safe? Remember the last time you didn't have control? And so those neural pathways are pinging and it's hard for us to calm ourselves down. So again, what play therapy can do, what um, these other modalities can do is it allows us to process those negative or the positive ones and being able to just say, that's not truth. Ah. That's not truth. And right. So it's getting your brain back online, you know, out of the right brain into the left brain in a way that your prefrontal can't do because of the trauma. Right. Exactly. And so then as that begins to shift, the next time you get into a trauma response and the back of the brain has been activated, the hippocampus has something else to pull from and go, oh, that's not true. Calms down quicker, you feel better, you feel more in control. And we know one of the things I battle with people a lot on, not battle them, but you know, the truths that they come in with as believers Mm -hmm. and being able to say, how is that in alignment with God's word? Yeah. And if you're saying you don't matter, Psalm 139 tells you differently. Right. He knitted you together, created you. First Peter 2, 9, you're a royal priesthood. Oh my gosh, you're a princess or a prince in God's kingdom, you know? And so that's another basis to be able to help battle those negative thought processes that are going on. But that's what those modalities can do is just give you more control over thoughts and um, your feelings and emotions. That's good. For anybody listening, Perry just blew through that in about six minutes. So that's some good stuff. You have to listen to it twice. Um, no, that's great. I mean, that's exactly what I wanted you to cover because that, you know, the average person who's listening to the podcast, you know, they're trying to figure out what it is that's happening. And I think as a culture, as the church, you know, what we're trying to be here with this podcast and just in general is a bridge between the secular world's, you know, philosophies on psychology and mental health and trauma and addiction and the church's philosophies on Jesus. And the bridge in between is like, we have to have a better way f- from a Christian perspective to explain these things to people because they're hearing one side of it from the world. You know, people, you know, now know the word trigger and know the word trauma, but they don't really know what that means, right. much less what that means in the face of, of Jesus and scripture and how do those two things t- come together. And mm-hmm. I think the reality is that we're always just trying to help people realize there is truth underneath all of these, you know, responses but you can't just give somebody truth when they're freaking out right? because you know, their, their left brain's not working, right? right? Kids, like you said, these implicit things, like kids don't know what's going on. They don't know what they're connecting to. And until you process and talk, I think people wonder like, well, why do I need to go talk about it? Right. Especially adults. Like, why do I need to talk about my trauma? And it's like, because if you don't externalize it and talk to someone and actively feel safe in the moment, 
and see that you can talk about this, then you can't figure out what's true. Right. You know, maybe it, maybe you are in danger. Maybe Mm -hmm. you're not, but until you figure out what's true, your brain can't come back on and start reacting. So you want to adjust the symptom of anxiety or depression, then you have to figure out what you're anxious and depressed about and whether that's actually a thing or not. Right. And if it is a thing, then you process it. You, you give the blame to who needs to have it, whether it's mom or dad or cousin or, you know, car wreck or whatever. And then your brain's like, Oh, okay. I can, I can do this now. I can deal with this. Absolutely. Um, so yeah. And we, again, we, I think we just don't talk about this. Mm-hmm. We, you know, from a church culture, we don't say, Hey, these are how kids are. And I mean, I think one of the things that changed the way I parent and deal with kids in general is just realizing like from zero to five, they're fully right brain developed, right? Which is why play works so well with two to five year olds, but you know, they don't have logic. Mm-hmm. And I've seen so many parents and I'm sure you, know, you can speak to this, this idea that the three year old knows better, <laughs> right? It's like, they don't, they don't actually know better. Right, they seem right. like they know better and they know a lot more than the, they, they were when they were 18 months. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But when a kid kind of looks at this cup and goes to touch it and looks at you, they're not, testing you and going, I'm going to be disrespectful and be disobedient. They're just trying to figure out their environment. They're trying to see how you're going to react. They're trying to find safety and connection. Boundaries. Yeah. But their brain actually isn't going, oh, I know this is wrong and I'm doing it anyway. Mm-hmm. But I think parents are like, well, I've told you a hundred times and, I, and I, I moved you from it or, you know, God forbid they beat them or whatever it is. And it's like, well, that they didn't learn, they're keep they're continuing to do it because they can't learn that lesson yet, right? Mm-hmm. They're not developmentally old enough to to know right from wrong. Right. So one of the things when I'm working, especially with my littles, and I usually refer to them about two to the four or five year range, is that the parent I think has an expect has an adult expectation of the child. So it is I know to follow the rule the first time. You should know to follow the rule the first time. And reality is, is the child hears you. And sometimes they are being willful. So in in my line of work as a, I'm going to use a big word here, Adlerian play therapist. Um, And basically what that means is we like connection. Um, And so what we believe is that there's four purposes to behavior. One is attention seeking. Um, Another is uh, power struggle. Revenge. Um, this is in in revenge is a lot of repair work that needs to be done with the parent, um, their caregiver, and then display of inadequacy. And so, if the child is touching something or doing something, if we as parents will stop for a second and go, "What's happening right now?" Rather than go, "I told you, don't do that again," we totally missed everything that the child was really communicating to us as they were reaching for that. Mm-hmm. So it very well could be, I just want some control here. My whole world is out of chaos. I just want to touch the cup. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, and sometimes it is, I don't know where the boundary is. So I'm going to touch this cup and I'll figure it out. You know, those kind of things. But our response, so Andy Stanley um, out of North Point, Georgia, uh, has this term, and I loved it, um, and a podcast that I heard from him. And he goes, what's your respondability? Mm. Because we are responsible for how we respond. Nobody's going to make me yell at you. I'm going to be doing that on my own, and I'm the only one that could take responsibility for that. So how we respond to the child when they are committing that behavior is important. And one of the things I appreciate about a lot of parents who come in my office is they're willing to shift their parenting to help navigate whatever the child is going through. And so I teach them um, an ACT method, acknowledge feelings, wishes, and wants communicate the limit if you're wanting to curb a behavior and think of an alternative or consequence you would state that twice implement the third time but the other thing i'm realizing as i do this work is it's not just about communicating a limit sometimes the child needs you to co-regulate with him so it's acknowledge feelings wishes and wants the other part that i've amended is the c and that is communicate co-regulation so i recognize you're really upset to the three-year-old that's you know throwing a tantrum on the floor because he couldn't get his purple cup instead of his blue one you know Um, which is is a legitimate thing it's it's a legitimate thing Uh, but what if instead of getting mad at him for throwing the tantrum we add another minute and just go wow must be really upsetting if that blue cup is dirty right now. What can we do together to help you? And with a three-year-old, they're going to look at you, oh, I don't know. But we could just hold them. We, ch- we could just go, well, you know what? Maybe tomorrow we could set that blue cup out so we can remember. We offer them a suggestion. We think of a different way. Rather than having to, and a lot of times it 
you know, we know children can be triggering. So it, it rises something up in us, and that's what really gets us mad at the situation because that inevitably happens when you've got a room full of people around. And you know. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, you're right. It, I think so much of it is, as a parent, your own unresolved issues. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we all try to teach our parents and, and people out there listening is we, it's not an expectation that you're not going to lose your temper, that you're going to not be impatient, that you're not going to mess up. It's that when we as a parents think that we don't know what to do, then we end up messing up three out of 10 times. Mm -hmm. Right. And the goal, and I always say is like seven or eight out of 10 times, do the right thing, have that extra minute, be patient. Mm -hmm. So then when you lose your temper or you lose your patience or you're too directive or you, you know, discipline inappropriately or whatever, the kid's not going to remember it. It's not going to affect the overall concept of the household, of their engagement with you, of their trust with you, of their behavior. But what happens is I think people don't know what we're talking about right now. They're kind of out of their depth. They're mm -hmm. going on with their day. They're busy. They're tired. They're frustrated. They're overwhelmed. They're mm -hmm. dealing with COVID or whatever's going on. And, you know, the kid asks you for, for a purple cup instead of a green when you don't have it. And then you feel bad maybe because you didn't do the dishes or because you didn't have what they needed. Exactly. And then your own childhood of, you know, well, my dad did this and he acted this way and I never got this from, and then you lash out right. and you don't realize, you know, that it's actually this unconscious, you know, unresolved trauma in you. And so, you know, our suggestion would be, you know, if you're messing up a large majority of the time, you find yourself doing things you don't want to do or responding in a way that's where you need to realize, well, this is a lot more about me as a parent than it is about this kid. Absolutely. You know, there's a lot of books out there about strong willed children and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, there's some good information, but there's also, you know, a lot of times kids are just being kids. Right. You know, that all lots of kids are strong willed. It's not this, you know, narrow group of kids who are difficult. It's just mm -hmm. kids are wanting to do what they want to do when they want to do it most mm -hmm. of the time. And that's super annoying for all of us as parents who are trying to get things done, you know, but it's not personal. Right. It's not personal. And you're not a bad parent because your kid's losing their mind or flipping out because of a purple cup. Um, you know, one of the things I see all the time is when, you know, there's a parent, they skip nap time, they take them to target. They didn't tell the kid, Hey, don't touch anything. And if you do, here's the consequence. They just wing it. Right. Mm -hmm. We go through our day and we just show up and I've, I've fallen into that trap of forgetting all the things that I usually do ahead of time. And then we're in wherever, and there's a meltdown. And then I'm super frustrated because I don't want to leave. I got stuff to do. We have to get this. But now I didn't set up the situation to be successful, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. I think a lot of that's, you know, as, as parents who have prefrontals and fully developed brains who we should be recovered and healthy, a lot of times we're not. And so our reactions are that we just didn't set the situation up for success. Mm -hmm. We didn't set our kid up for it. Right. And I think, and you know, one of the things I told uh, a parent the other day, they were talking about, well, I tried this. I did everything I was supposed to. And it just... But I'm telling you, when the child, when the parent um, told me what had happened and all the components, and I was like, dude, you were in the perfect storm. Right. <laughs> I don't know I would have wound up any different, you know. So you got, I think as parents, we hold ourselves up sometimes to a very high standard that not even we can achieve. And it's not about meeting, I need to be super mom or I need to be super dad. It is, am I loving my child yeah. the best that I can? Um, with what I have and do I need more tools to love him or her the best that I can so it's not about being perfect it's about going I need to meet my child's need and I need to connect and I need to love and am I doing that one book that um, really speaks to that of course I'm a Dan Siegel fan myself mm -hmm. but parenting from the inside out yep. and he talks about in there about how our uh, trauma as parents or how we were raised impacts what we do now and what we can do if as a parent we are triggered you know, I ask my parents all the time, um, how old are you in that moment? Yeah, that's good. So if in that moment you can't be your current self, you don't need to be saying or doing anything. Walk right. away, take a breath, take a high five, do whatever you need to, to just until you can get back to your present self. Well, yeah, that, that's beautiful because the reality is, is it, it most of the time in my experience as a parent and just in therapy is a minute or four minutes makes the world of difference. And yeah, there are circumstances where you feel like you have to leave the house or you're running late or whatever. Again, that comes to, did you plan well? But the reality is, is one minute of stopping and going, okay, I'm going to, let's say, take some deep, deep breaths. You know, we'll be somewhere and, and Jude will have hurt himself or Grady will be frustrated. And I'll say, okay, let's breathe. You know, you know, we'll start breathing. They start breathing. And then the tears stop. And, and you know, other parents look at me like I'm crazy. 
you know, because they just didn't learn it. It's not that I'm a better parent. It's I happen to be a therapist and I work with you and I work with other people and I read Dan Siegel and Tina Bryson and all these things. Um, but it works and it doesn't take very long. I mean, it doesn't take more than a minute, not even a minute of doing those deep breathings with my kids. And usually they redirect and move on, mm -hmm. but it's validating that experience for them. It's D and we talked about this on the podcast about cops and you know, all these things. It's like, so much of it is the same answer to all the problems. It's mm -hmm. validate your kid, de-escalate them first, and then they can learn. Mm -hmm. You know, if your kid's melting down, you saying, well, you should have known better or don't do that or let me teach you why this is wrong, they can't hear or learn or take it in. Because they're, they're in the back of the brain. They're right. They're so over overstimulated that they can't learn the lesson. Mm -hmm. But because we're frustrated and we're in our right brain, you know, and we're in the back of our brain and we're like, oh, I want to I want to protect you and keep you safe. And I, you need to know this or you're going to grow up to be a 15 year old, you know, who smokes crack. Like, that's where we go as parents. Mm -hmm. You know, we get fearful of, oh, my gosh, I've told you not to open the door, or leave it unlocked or I've told you to do this and you're not. So that means you're going to be a de degenerate in 10 years and I'm a bad mom or I'm a bad dad. And, you know, then the cycle just stops. And I right. think. If people can just realize that's what's happening mm -hmm. and that's what happens to all of us even therapists right mm -hmm. i mean we've oh, talked yes. about this before like just in our own relationship or in other relationships like we know what's going on but that doesn't always mean you can stop it right you know you can't always help your brain from going into fight or flight or you know based on your own stuff absolutely absolutely and uh, one of the things too again that we have to remember is it's connection before correction yep um, that's good and being able just to stop and go okay what's the most important thing right now um, the child needs to know that even in my anger, my mom, my dad, my caregiver can handle my anger. Yeah, and and one one thing happened a long time ago, well, a long time ago, a couple of years, but uh, when Grady lied to me for the first time, right? So Jude and him are in this in our bedroom, and I go in there, and Jude's like 18 months, and he's up on the bed, and uh, I walk in, I'm like, buddy, how how did you get on the bed? He's like, I don't know. And I'm like, well, did you put him on the bed? He's like, no. And that was like the first, he was like three, three and a half. This was the first time he just bald, you know, face lied to me. And, uh, and so I realized I started to get frustrated. And then I realized like, man, your, your pre your preset is to lie. Like, I don't have to teach you to lie. Right. I don't have to teach you to sin. I don't have to teach you to be disobedient. So why am I frustrated that you're doing what you're like preset to do? Mm -hmm. It's my job to teach you how not to lie, right. how to be honest, how to self-regulate, how to do these things. But sometimes as parents, we think they should just come out as like a, an adult who knows all the answers and things. And, it, and, and the reality is, is like, that's their, that's their preset. Like we have to teach them how to do the right things and overcome themselves and their sins and their brokenness and their psychology and, and their generational epigenetics and what happened to us and what happened to our parents Absolutely. and all the things passed down to them, you know, that is not as easy as just don't do it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> if don't do it was it, somebody would have trademarked it. Right. For sure. It's the opposite of Nike. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's the parent Nike. Just don't do it. Just parent stop. Nike. Yes. I like it. So, um, I wear a size nine if anybody needs to know that. <laughs> yeah, nice. Um, uh, talk a little bit about, you know, so we talked about trauma, the brain kind of unpacking this. Yeah. Dan Siegel, Tina Bryson, those are great people. Uh, no drama discipline. Discipline is a fantastic book. I love um, the idea when it, when it talks about discipline versus punishment. So mm -hmm. can you speak a little bit to that? Sure, sure. So a lot of times we punish, and punishment often has to do with us, I think, more than the child. Um, we feel betrayed. We feel it's personal to us, and so we go that route. Whereas discipline has the ability to bring in an opportunity to change a behavior. Mm -hmm. Punishment is just, it's right then, you know, I'm gonna, and, and there's no fault to this. We're not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying as an example, we're gonna spank right then. Well, okay, so that's the punishment. Where's the discipline? Mm -hmm. Because just spanking isn't going to change the behavior. Right. Um, we look at it and go, okay, what in this moment does this child need to know in order to help him feel, number one, connected, and number two, to know that this isn't the best possible consequence um, or the best possible outcome for him or her. So, you know, discipline allows for behavioral change while still feeling 
that connection yeah on there that's good yeah i mean the root word right for discipline is disciple which means mm. to teach mm -hmm. so one of the things dan siegel talks about and he's not even a christian i mean i don't know if he's a christian but he's not a christian author he doesn't mention this but it's funny that it parallels so well but it's like you know what am i trying to teach them by giving them this consequence mm -hmm. and i think we forget that you know mm -hmm. if they're you know not putting their dishes up or if it's a teenager and they're not doing their homework are you trying to teach them that you just have to be obedient to me because I said it? Or are you trying to teach them to actually do their homework and what the benefits of those are? Mm -hmm. You know, I use that example all the time of like, you know, getting somebody to put their hand out and I say, don't touch this pen or whatever. And then I, they go to touch it and I smack their hand and I'm like, well, what'd you learn? And they're like, that you're going to hit me if I do something you don't like. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's what you learned. You didn't learn why not to touch the pen, that the mm -hmm. pen's dangerous, that, you know, you need to trust me over trusting you, you know, all those kind of things. Um, you know, that's, that's not what they learn. They don't learn about the pen, mm -hmm. but in your head as a parent, you back off and you're like, well, man, I really wanted them to learn about the pen and how dangerous it is or whatever it is knife, you know? Um, but I ended up just smacking them because I didn't want them to do it. And I thought they would learn that on their own. Right. But that's punishment. Mm -hmm. And I think about it a lot. Like, you know, when it comes to scripture and God, like God does not punish us. Right. There are consequences. There is discipline. Um, but he's not Zeus. You know, he's not like, oh, you know, you cussed today. So, bam, the, you know, your car popped the tire, you know. Right. But sometimes as parents, we kind of go down that same that same route and think it's our actually our our duty to punish and to give these consequences or our kids are going to end up, you know, like I said earlier, dead in a ditch somewhere or whatever. Yeah, you might need to smack my hand from this microphone because I've already hit it twice. <laughs> no, you can hit it. It's fine. <laughs> Nobody cares. Um, um, if I can say something to sure. that to you is that I have a lot of adults. Um, you know, we are a faith-based uh, counseling center here. And, you know, they they come in knowing that. And they do. They are believers. And how many adults I have, how many parents I have that believe god just can't love them because they're not good enough mm -hmm. um that negative those negative thought processes you know spill over into their spiritual life as well and so they try to hold themselves to a perfect standard because that's the only time god can love me mm -hmm. then they translate that to their children and so a lot of times the the punishment is but you got to be perfect you got to do oh, this. Yeah. You got to do that. And so, you know, or I love you based on your efforts. I love you based on your efforts. And, and I lean back again, scripture hasn't changed in 2000 years. It's not going to change today. So the God that, that wrote that, that is part of that. He still tells you today that while we were still sinners, we were saved by grace. Mm -hmm. God did not wait till we were uh, clean of our sin. He died on the cross knowing we were still sinners, knowing we would still sin. Yep. And so there is no effort-based grace. Grace is what it is. Andy Stanley, I, I listen to him. He's a great communicator, but he has this podcast about truth and grace. And he says, when truthy met crazy. And he said, we are real good at times giving truth, 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 truth. So just imagine as a parent, it is truth, 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 truth. So that's going to be the one that may be rigid, that maybe I said it, you do it. There's no questions asked. Um, it, grace is very little involved in that. Um, then we might err on the side of giving grace, 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 grace. And that's going to be kind of your permissive parenting style. You want to go jump off the roof? Sounds like a good idea to me. What time? You know, right. that kind of thing. And so we want to find the middle of that where it's both truth and grace. And what Andy Stanley does in his series is he pours two waters together. and One is blue. Yellow and blue make green. So, and one of them is yellow. You're the plate therapist. I know. I know. I'm trying to remember my color to will. Um, and so we pour that together, and that creates the beautiful scene. So when I'm applying truth to a child, it is not this hardcore punishment truth. Whenever we apply, we offer grace, that allows for the discipline. Mm -hmm. Because then I'm going to look at your behavior and I'm going to say, you know, this wasn't a, this wasn't a great idea. Right. You don't get bad to... Bad plan. <laughs> bad idea. Um, you, you know, and there's going to be a consequence for that. But my love doesn't change for you. Mm, and so, that's so good. my pun, you know, the, the truth is not going to drive the consequence. It's going to be that I need you to be the safest person that you can be and so we're going to apply both truth and grace we don't do this because but because i love you then x y and z for know? sure and that's hard to do if you as a parent haven't processed your own exactly. stuff and accepted grace for yourself and mm -hmm. you know recovered from whatever childhood trauma i mean i tell people all the time you know when we had grady you know 
when he was probably, you know, when he was born and then up until two, there was just so much I didn't even realize that was going to come up for me as a father mm-hmm. and, you know, that was bringing up my own childhood stuff. And yeah. so now when I'm my friends, you know, clients, I'm always like, okay, you're about to have a baby. You really need to double down on doing your own work because you're going to be surprised by how much, you know, it affects, Absolutely. you know, everything that you're doing. And I think people just forget that that's the case. And, um, and then just parent, you know, and just wing it and mm-hmm. they do the best they can. And, mm-hmm. um, the other thing I think I try to remember, and I know you would agree is that, you know, they're, we're all God's children and Absolutely. your children are God's children. Mm-hmm. So even if you're out there and you're hearing all, you hear all this stuff today and you're like, Oh my gosh, I didn't know any of it. I've been botching it for 15 years or botching it for five years. Like children are super resilient. Mm-hmm. And you know, if you can get back on board and change them, they, they will, they will snap out of it and recover and be right back. And then they'll never remember, you know, this stuff from when they were three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's only when we don't recover as parents, we don't do the work, we don't repair that then our kids 25 and they're like, remember when you did this, you know, remember when you did that, you know, they're only going to say that if you never do any work, if you never do that repair. But mm-hmm. I think a lot of parents are afraid that like, Oh man, I messed my kid up forever. So now what? So now I'll just kind of keep doing the same thing. Cause I don't know or I'm too scared to do anything or take responsibility mm-hmm. when in reality it's that repair and that responsibility that actually makes everything okay. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And some, you know, when we get into trauma, I think uh, we have to realize too that sometimes chaos is the norm. Mm-hmm. It feels comfortable. Peace feels uncomfortable. Yeah. So when we look at the family dynamic and we're like, it's just a hot mess everywhere we go, everywhere we do, it's it's a chaos and it's just broken down. And then when we implement p- peace or even the thought of doing that, like, I don't know if I want that, right. you know, because that's triggering in and of itself because our brain has been hypervigilant for so long. And so, you know, to anyone out there that's listening, peace is available. It is real. Right. Hope is real. Um, and yes, it's hard. And there will be tears if there's repair work that needs to be done with a child, but it can be done. Mm-hmm. And that's what we have to remember is that it, peace, hope, joy, all of those things are available to everyone. Yeah. That's so good, Perry. Um, yeah, I think I think people have to realize that when it comes to our kids because they are our future. Yes. You know, they're the hope that we have, especially within, you know, the Christian worldview um, and the way that the world is going. We have to have more healthy kids who become healthy adults who have Absolutely. healthy marriages, so that the church and you know doesn't look just like the world. I mean, our divorce mm-hmm. rate's the same. Yeah, you know, it's 50 fifty percent in both you know the secular world and within the church, and mm-hmm. that is because us as adults were children who never got what we're trying to provide children here Mm -hmm. and never went in and did that internal child work and never repaired. And now those two kids who never, you know, they say your trauma, you know, you're kind of stuck at the age in which your trauma happened if you never deal with it. So you've had some significant trauma at six and now you're 22 trying to get married and you never dealt with that thing. You end up acting like a six year old in your, in your conflict with your spouse. Yeah. I mean, I know I've done it. You know, you stay in an (laughs) argument for, I think, what is it, like seven, you lose seven years every five minutes you stay in an argument or something Uh cognitively. So it's like, think about it. You know, you've been in an argument for 30 minutes. Everybody's screaming, yelling, crying, hysterical. They're that kid who can't get the purple cup. Yeah, exactly. It's it's just, nobody just stays in it and and, just kind of talks through it. Right. I um, tell my, my parents, too, that there's four ages to us. There's a cognitive age. There's the physical age, there's a relational age, and there's an emotional age. And so when we're breaking down the behaviors of children, you know, we look at those con- those concepts. And then when we look at the emotional age, if that emotional age is lower, let's say the child's 10, but emotionally they're five, that's arrested development. What happened at five? that they emotionally know feel like they can't go on any Mm -hmm. further and so one of the reasons i got into this field is number one i told god i wouldn't i think he was like ha 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 um and so you know i told him not working with children went to a conference walked out working with children (laughs) that's how it happens (laughs) that's how it happens and so but it was my own trauma as a child it was my own trauma at nine losing my father and often tell people i lost my mom and dad in a day i lost my dad physically i lost my mom emotionally and didn't have recovery until 
I was 22 was the first time we talked about my dad's death, my mother and I, and then two years later she died. And so, and I'm my only child, didn't have connection with other family. And even going through high school, even through that turmoil, just knowing there's got to be something more mm -hmm. out there and knowing I didn't want anybody else to experience this same thing. And so now when I'm looking at these parents, the one thing or these children that I try to implement over and over and over is that I will be your holder of hope until you're ready to take it back because yep. right now I know it's hard for you to even believe there is some mm -hmm. but there is and you have to hold on to the fact that I'm I will hold it until you're ready to take it back and so we do have parents that will will come in on their last leg <laughs> driving in and and to be able to be a witness to watching them recover um, their family recover is just a beautiful beautiful sight oh, that's great thank you for that vulnerability I mean I know I know that story but you know I think that's what makes you such a strong person and all of us that that are here that are doing therapy and doing this work is when you've done your own work mm -hmm. you know when you can empathize and not just sympathize when you right. understand that grief that mm -hmm. type of grief losing up you know a parent that young is super traumatic mm -hmm. i think that's the other problem is we've normalized neglect emotional neglect physical neglect abuse physical you know physical abuse we've normalized it so much within the culture and the church they were just like, oh, you know, I, I got spanked my whole life and I turned out fine. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, okay, well, you're in my office. You've been divorced twice. You're addicted. You have an anger problem, but you turned out fine. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's this idea of what's fine. Mm -hmm. You're like, I don't want my kids to be fine. Mm -hmm. I don't want my kids to thrive and excel and have every opportunity emotionally, spiritually, and physically to do what it is that God calls them to do. And so... You know, we've talked before about that, just being able to deal with our own trauma as therapists, as pastors, as leaders, as parents. Um, so much of parenting goes back to that. Absolutely. You know, is, is having that on insight into your own stuff and realizing that, like, if you don't recover, if you don't deal with your own issues, you know, you just act it out. And then that generational sin and that generational cycle happens. And that's what happened to us. Right. You know, we can trace that. If you want to find, I was telling Andy this morning, um, if you want to find somebody to blame, It'll go all the way back to Adam and Eve. You know, I can say, well, my dad, you know, wasn't there for me. They divorced when I was eight. You know, that caused me so much trauma. You know, and I was mad about that for a long time. But through therapy, I realized, like, well, his dad was an alcoholic, and he had issues, and he right. struggled. And so my dad only had so much to give. And then his dad, like, you know, I mean, you again, you can go all the way back if you're looking for who's responsible sure. to sin and brokenness in the world. That doesn't mean that I don't. I get to just go. Oh well, because his dad was, you know, not a good dad, and, mm -hmm. and he wasn't a good dad. Then I'll not be, you know. Right. At some point, you have to recognize, like, no, this shouldn't have happened. This is what what I should have been through. But at, you know, I was going to say, asking why, right, is the mm -hmm. is the point, right? Asking why these things happened. Why did I respond this way? Why is this the system? Is the only way to change the cycle, so that our kids have a better shot, right? Absolutely. So that they have a better shot at having better coping skills less addiction, less trauma, which kind of brings us to, you know, we talked about trauma a little bit, but I want to talk about, um, you know, ADHD, ODD, you know, these, this idea of bad kids and symptoms and all that kind of stuff. Can, can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. So one of the things there was a, um, quote that I saw is that there are no bad kids there are only bad behaviors and again I, I lean back on that behaviors have purpose every behavior has a purpose and so if if we're really willing to step back and go what is that behavior what is that child trying to communicate to me in their behavior that may allow parents or as a clinician myself um to sit back and go, what what's the need there that's being unmet, that they're crying out in this way to me? Um, of course, you know, with ADHD, ODD, um, some of them are chemical imbalances. Just truth to that. But some are not. Um, mm -hmm. ADHD can mimic trauma. Um, ADHD can mimic hypervigilance in the brain for whatever's there. So we really have to break all those things down. And again, an ADHD brain, a true chemical imbalance with that ADHD going on in there, they can't just sit still. Right. Right. And so they can't just listen to you the first time. So why are you going to impose something on them, a uh, expectation that they can't follow? Yeah, wow. we. I had a client recently um, who, 
you know, their kid has ADHD for real ADHD. It's not, I mean, it is a symptom of trauma, but you know, it's a mixed bag, Mm -hmm. but they have a chemical issue Mm -hmm. and they're homeschooling right now. uh, Well, not homeschooling, but they're doing the like whatever virtual virtual learning. And so he's got, you know, um, it's not Google classroom, it's canvas. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to, he's got to be there eight hours a day sitting in front of the computer doing these classes and he physically can't do it. Right. So he's missing assignments. He's failing, but there's no, real plan for that kid Mm -hmm. in the culture to help and the Mm -hmm. mom's frustrated and he's frustrated and it's a hot mess yeah you know but the reality is is that like you're saying sometimes they just literally can't do it so we need another game plan right you know and that's what i was telling the mom this morning like the reality is is you can discipline him until the cows come home but if he really has adhd if he's really compulsive uh, I mean, impulsive and can't focus and loses focus. Like we've got to get a different plan. And so many parents, I think, don't know their kid has that diagnosis, mm-hmm. um, and you know, continue to punish, continue to give consequences. There's, mm-hmm. a, you know, conflict and trauma, and you know, and then it just makes the whole situation worse. Absolutely. And then you have the other situation where, like you just mentioned, that it's they don't have ADHD, which is a large, I think, a large population of kids. Because our culture doesn't understand trauma, mm-hmm. our doctors are, you know, are, you know, even our psychiatrists to some degree, like they really don't take trauma into con- consideration when they're using the DSM mm-hmm. or when they're doing their assessment. Mm-hmm. And so the kid is impulsive or they're, you know, they're angry or they're short tempered or they check out. And it could be because, you know, my parents are in the military and I've moved five times in six years. You know, and so I don't have attachment to things. I don't feel safe. And now I show up at school and I'm not focusing and I'm chewing on my pen and, you know, I'm doing all these things. It's like, oh, well, he has ADHD. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is it- not so much. Right. <laughs> um, and then the ODD part is just like ODD is oppositional defiant disorder. And again, right, the idea is like there's this kid. He talks back to the adults. He responds angrily. Um, so I hit it for you. Um, he, you know, he responds in an angry way. And so it's like, well, you have oppositional defiant and that's going to turn into some personality disorder later. But then you sit with the kid and it's like, well, all of the adults in his life have abused him to some degree or punished him for things that are not his fault. And so of course he's defiant to, you know, adults like that. That's a perfect, like we go back to what you said earlier. It's a perfect response to what he's experienced. But now he has this label as being a bad kid. He's got this unique, you know, issue of being oppositionally defiant. And so caregivers, teachers, psychiatrists, therapists, they go, oh, well, this kid's this way. So now I'm going to respond and not allow him to be defiant. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is that, you know, he can't do it any other way until he heals from this trauma. Absolutely. And that's one thing when when parents walk in and they go, I just think he's this or I think he's that. We have to look at the whole totality of it. We can't just take one behavior and go, he's a bad kid. Yeah. No, we have to look at what happened before that hyper that behavior how did we handle the behavior what was our responsibility to that behavior and if we are willing to explore that we might come up with a different conclusion Mm -hmm. to that behavior so you know we have to be very cautious on as parents even putting a label on the children um, because we don't want you know we're taught it as therapists in school you know do you label or do you not label you know the whole diagnosis thing and that kind of stuff but you know really we have to look at it what benefit are we giving the kid when we label them? Mm-hmm. Um, are we excusing ourselves from responsibility? Or are we excusing our children yeah. from responsibility? Is there a benefit? And so being able to look at that child for who the child is. If God created us in our inmost being, if every day was written in his book before one has come to be, as Psalm 139 says, then that child is important and valuable enough and more so than a label. And so we have to really be willing to engage that child at his need. Yeah, it's good. Well, the label is just addressing, again, the symptom. Exactly. Right. It's not addressing the person, the heart, the unique story in which they got to the situation in, whether that's a kid or an adult. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that if you can work with kids, you can work with any adult because they're just working out their kid stuff. I'd say that all the time, that the more trainings I go to for the children, the more I understand adults. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I mean, much better. I mean, I did in-home therapy for five years with kids at risk and children's home and, you know, being able to work with them and deal with, you know, those conflicts and those issues there, you know, it's a lot, but once you do that and then you start working with adults, you're just like, Oh, you're just playing this out 15 years later or 30 Mm -hmm. years later. And so if you're a parent, you know, adult, listen to this, obviously like realize, you know, stop and think like, man, what is it that's going on for me? 
within the parenting realm that I can take responsibility for, that I can find healing from so that I can do things better. Because I think a lot of us struggle with feeling good enough, especially in the culture that we're in. Yeah, and I would even say, you know, parents listening to this, caregivers listening to this, just know that one bad moment doesn't equal a lifetime of bad Mm -hmm. moments. And so you are doing plenty of good things but we also have to just address those things that are impacting not just the child, but the function of the family dynamic mm-hmm. that's in there. But I just want to make sure, you know, we're not criticizing parents. We're just talking about reality of life that oh, we sure. live in in a very fallen world. Yeah, I, I mean, I fail all the time as a dad, you know. Um, I, I hope with the training that I have and the work that I do and the reading that I do, it's few and far between. Sure. So there is... There is that again, going back to do the right thing seven or or eight thing yeah. times out of ten. You know, yeah. don't don't get overwhelmed with, well, that sounds good, Clinton Perry, but this is hard. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. But it gets easier the more you practice and do Absolutely. it. But it's, it, anything is hard when you first do it. You know, it's, yeah. it's just like working out. You start lifting weights, you're going to be sore. You know, you start trying to engage with your kid. They're not immediately going to be like oh, okay, great, let's attach. (laughs) You know, if anything, sometimes they get worse before they get better. Absolutely. um, Because they're testing, like, how much are you going to keep this up? Yeah. Because their behavior works for them too, right? I mean, their anger, they're pushing you away, they're not listening. If you're in this systemic, you know, system of, oh, we're doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, then you're going to have to stop doing that behavior for a while before they adjust. Right. But they will adjust eventually. Absolutely. It's just going to take some effort and some time. Yeah. So I think parents get a little overwhelmed with like, oh my gosh, you don't know what my life's like. I got this and I got that. And that may all be true. Come to therapy and talk about it so that you can find and navigate through and have somebody have a, you know, a view that's not biased and go, okay, all that's true. Just like the kid who can't sit in the classroom. Maybe there's something as a parent as a single mom, as a single dad, as a single, you know, as a parent with a, a spouse who doesn't want to parent the same way. Yeah. Maybe that, maybe you can't do that. Maybe it's not that easy, but we've got to navigate and help figure out what can you do. Absolutely. And you spoke on something earlier in this part of the conversation about um, sometimes uh, emotional neglect is mm-hmm. um, not mentioned or not uh, noticed and I just want to lean but we it's on our list but a uh, perfect time to talk about is the ACEs score yeah. and so the ACEs was developed to as a guideline to go okay if you've had this amount of trauma these could be the physical outcomes of how that trauma is manifested and so it's the adverse at childhood experiences, experiences yeah. yes ACEs. Um, thank you because yep. uh, I forgot okay. <laughs> I'm just gonna be real on that one what it meant but um, I know its purpose so it lists 10 questions and I was at a training um, for play therapy and so the uh, person leading the training pulled it up I said, I want everybody in the room to take it. Mm -hmm. So we did. And I was like, well, before you go, so just to list them, right? It's, uh, it's physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, um, a a parent incarcerated, um, a parent with, with drugs, divorce, a mental health in your family. Um, a couple of questions go along with each one, I yeah. think. So, I mean, I think you've I always got, miss one or two. But. Yeah. And they're probably, they're all interconnected. Yeah. And so she had us take the test. And when I took it, I scored extremely low. And I was like, this is not right. right. Because I know my own story. And so uh, she said, what do you notice about the ACEs score, so several people raised their hand. Number one, grief isn't in there. Mm-hmm. It um, doesn't talk about the death of a parent. Um, that's what I experienced or where my trauma resulted from um, or started. And then uh, it, there were a couple of other ones, and I'm trying to remember what they were. But then she goes, oh, how did it make you feel as you took this test? And I remember raising my hand, and I just said, forgotten. And so the ASA score is a beautiful tool to for those things that you just mentioned. Um, to be able to explore how those experiences are manifesting physically now with our, you know, we know that um, it can affect our digestive tract, our coronary type things, all of those, but it doesn't assess for everything. So it is a screening tool. It is not a diagnostic tool where we give a diagnosis of, of something to that sort. But so there are some limitations to it. However, if you want, you know, anybody listening to this, you can just type in ACES and it'll come up. It'll come up with the test. 
list and you can can look at that on your own but it is it will reveal some very startling statistics to you as to what you could endure and you maybe go oh my gosh i had no idea that's where it came from oh for sure i mean it also helps you have a lot of empathy you know for other people you know when we we work with purchased uh which is our the human trafficking organization we work with and when we work with the love well downtown and poverty you know all those people have six seven eight high ACE scores you know yeah and uh, you know one thing you're mentioning is is it's a predictor of what they've realized over 40 years is that it's a predictor of copd heart disease Mm -hmm. uh, you know heart attack early death divorce you know anxiety depression you know it's a if if you have the higher ACE score is the the more likely it is for you to you know experience those things. Yes. But you're right. There's a lot that that's not in there. But mm-hmm. the point is is like a lot of times I think as Christians with our kids with other people we see people uh, you know who have had an affair or who you know who are smoking crack or who are prostituting or a kid who steals or a kid who's getting in fights at school. And our first instinct, you know, is to be judgmental and to be like, well, oh my gosh, can you believe so-and-so did that? Or can you believe so-and-so is doing this? But understanding the ACES score and doing what we do and, and really following the teachings of Jesus, if you understand that these things are predictive of that behavior, then your first assumption be, should be, well, I wonder what they went through, mm-hmm. right? That that behavior is a symptom of, Yes. you know? And I think with kids, especially, I think that's what's so beautiful is you're able to do that in the room with them mm-hmm. when the whole society has been set up to judge them and criticize them, excuse me, for their behavior. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think you would have, all of us here would probably have, be able to attest to this. We've had people come in our office and go, what's wrong with me? Oh yeah. And I tell them all the time for what you've gone through, you're acting completely normal. Absolutely. And what a relief. They just like, Oh, okay. I said, society doesn't know that because society doesn't understand trauma. Society doesn't all these things. But if I had your situation, I can't say that I would act any differently. Yeah. Well, we're all focused on behavior modification. Mm -hmm. You know, the church, society, school, judiciary systems, police. I mean, everything is, basically that punishment type idea Mm -hmm. and and that comes from psychology that comes Mm -hmm. from a broken view of church and religion Mm -hmm. of don't cuss don't you know don't Mm -hmm. smoke don't date anybody who does and you're fine and god will be happy with you and that seeps into the narrative of of the world of psychology of like okay you're you're a kid who does these behaviors so we're going to do these you know play you know we're going to do these certain activities and you're going to stop the behavior Mm -hmm. you know it never gets down to the heart of the issue and the root of the problem, which is what we've talked about when it comes to trauma and ACEs score and all that. Um, The other thing that I, you know, that we're going to go into and I appreciate you bringing the ACEs score up is because one of the things that I think, especially that I wanted to cover today on the podcast um, is what, you know, emotional neglect, physical neglect and physical and emotional abuse are, but all four of those are on there. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that's not mentioned is what I've kind of termed sexual neglect. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think, you, I know we've talked about this a ton, but in the last six months, especially, we've had a ton. I've had a ton of people call me and say, "Hey, my kid's doing this. What is this normal? What do I do?" Um, and sexual neglect, I describe as not talking to your child about masturbation, menstruation, um, pornography, safe touch. You know anything. You know boundaries with that. Private parts. Um, naming it a penis and a vagina. When you don't do that, it's neglectful. And I don't mean it's neglectful like intentionally. I don't think parents, like my parents, didn't talk to me about any of that. Um, and I don't think they intentionally neglected me. But in the world that we live in, in the bodies that we live in, with the emotional components we live in, whether you knew it or not, if you don't prepare your kid for that, it's neglectful. Mm-hmm. And one of the examples I use all the time is um, when I was teaching Grady's, my oldest, how to cross the street, right? It's, there's a sidewalk in front of our house. You know, When we used to live in South Highlands, we'd come out the front door and I'd say, hey, look, you have to hold my hand when you're on the sidewalk. There are cars that come on the street. We walk this way. If you're going to cross the street, you look both ways. You know, if you get hit by a car, you could die. I will never see you again. You're going to get Bobos, whatever, you know, analogy. Um, and so I would teach him that. And of course, I wouldn't let him do that just right off the bat. I, would, I kept walking, kept doing it till now we can walk on the sidewalk and he didn't just run through the street. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, mm-hmm. unless he sees a friend and he yeah. wants to go say, hey, and then he doesn't pay attention. He's six. <laughs> Um, but the point is, is that with sexual neglect, it's similar where we, we almost, you know, we don't, they don't even know cars exist, mm. right? So they're growing up, we, they're six, seven, eight, 
there's all these opportunities to teach them about boundaries, about, you know, their private parts, about privacy, about, you know, all these things. And then they go to a birthday party at eight, you know, and some kid who has seen porn or has been abused or hasn't had any, and has neglect, you know, they want to do something with them or they try something with them. And all of a sudden it's like, it's like they're walking across the street and they get hit by a car because they didn't know cars existed Mm -hmm. because we never told them, you know, about that. So I, I think that that's one of the things that, it, my experience as a child was that is that I grew up, you know, in a in a society in the you know '80s where we got to ride our bikes everywhere. You know, we had TVs in our bedrooms, we had sleepovers and campouts. But all of my friends and and across the country and the world at this point, when I've talked to people, you know, I can be in a room full of a thousand people and and say, raise your hand if your parents talk to you about masturbation, and three people will raise their hand. And it's not enough to just say like put a helmet on that soldier, you know, and put a condom on or, Hey, don't do that. There has to be a, just like we do with spelling, just like we do with crossing the street, there has to be a developmentally appropriate walk through these things when it comes to sexuality. And I think it's interesting within the church that sexuality is something that we rarely touch on. And yet there's a whole book in the Bible dedicated just to sexuality and how good it is and how important it is and how amazing it is. But because we don't address it with our children, and, and it's not even in the aces when it comes to these kind of conversations, it just speaks to that forgotten, mm. hidden part. And so when I was 11 or 12, and I'm going through puberty, and I engage with my cousin wrestling, and I get an erection, and it feels good, and I keep going, and I don't, you know, I don't know what to do with that, I have zero context. Like, what is this? What's happening? Right. And what we want for parents is to teach their kids appropriately what those things are. So when they get in that situation, well, most likely they won't get in that situation because they know. Mm-hmm. Right. But for me, that wasn't the case. So then I blame myself. Mm-hmm. Then I shame myself. Mm-hmm. I didn't go tell my parents because I certainly wasn't going to tell them something like that because you cannot not communicate. Right? right. So they already communicated to me. We don't talk about this. Unwritten rules. Right, by not talking about it. So in my head at, at 10 or 11, I'm like, well, I am i don't know. And then I got older and developmentally knew what was happening. And then I shamed myself even more because I viewed it differently. As a, I didn't view myself as a 10-year-old who didn't know better. I viewed myself as a 15-year-old who should have known better. Mm-hmm. And that led to all kinds of shame and secrets and issues, which led to you know a, a disaster of things. Yeah. And so I say that to be vulnerable, but also like to give a practical example of what I'm still seeing now as a almost 40 year old man in my office and not much has changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a little bit better of understanding, but within, within the culture, this idea of sexual neglect and the importance of it, I mean, it's so vital right now. So I have people call me all the time. Hey, how my kids eight, nine, he's starting to masturbate. What do I do? Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, that should have been a conversation at two. Yeah. Two years old when they first touched their penis. What do you say? Mm -hmm. You know, so Can you speak to, I know I went on a tangent, but can you speak to the importance of private parts and um, like using the right vernacular and why that is? Yeah, sure. So, you know, we live in the South and one of the things I think that drive home in the South is prim and proper. And when you talk about sex, that is not prim and proper, you know? Um, And so what happens is if we, don't explore that with children children are going to figure it out on their own Mm -hmm. and probably not from the best sources on there so we definitely want to make sure that we do that and so one of the things you want to do and i have a website it'll be on our facebook page or on our actual web page and it is a website that is has free resources for parents ministers um other therapists um to do and i did a talk at a church and that powerpoint is on there and it's how to speak to children at developmental levels and the research has shown the earlier you talk about it the more you normalize it mm-hmm. and so the more it isn't an unwritten rule we don't talk about that here we talk about it and so one of the reasons we want to at two be able to say that's your vagina that's your penis whatever it is is because if they are touched and we've used oh that's your ho-ho then the child says oh he touched me in my ho-ho well, there's also a candy or, you know, whatever. We don't know the the police officer or whatever doesn't know how to address that because that could be anywhere. Uh-huh. But if we teach them those parts that this is what it is, when the child says it, 
then it's more than likely where he or she was touched right. on there. So that's why it's important to go ahead and use those terms. I think, too, a lot of times parents um, go through their own grieving process when mm-hmm. having to talk about sex with their child because they feel it's a loss of innocence yeah. for that child. And rightfully so. Yes, we mourn that because we live in a society today, sex is everywhere. Uh, we're not immune to seeing soft porn. We're not immune. I mean, it's on billboards. It's it's everywhere. And so, yes, you grieve that, but you are also providing safety to your child when you begin the conversation with them and you use these developmental um, appropriate language and tools to be able to tell them what's going on and how they feel. It's not shameful. Sex c- was created as a beautiful thing. So we don't need to shame it, but we need to put boundaries around it. And so if we talk to our kids about it, we are able to emphasize the value of it, um, the values we um, apprise and those kind of things. And then the child, when making a decision, when they're 13 and they're not, and they're with you and they're at a party and somebody says, hey, why don't we go back here? They're able to make a decision going, you know what? We've already talked about this in my home. Eh, eh, peace out. You right. Know? And, and not only have we talked about it, we've talked about it for, you know, 10 years exactly you know it's not just it's not these isolated incidents that happen that um that parents are you know terrified of it's it's over time and i think you know in my own experience you know yeah i mean i know all this and there's still this fear of if i start talking about this with you and address it then it's going to become a thing right i think that's a lot of people's avoidance Mm -hmm. like you know well i'm not going to talk about sex because then they're going to want to have it it's like okay your 15 year old already knows what sex is Surprise, surprise. Yeah. Um, but the reality is, is that the more you talk about it, the more normalized it is, the less taboo it is, and the less people want to like go and experiment and try weird stuff or try risky things because it is just what it is. Mm-hmm. They understand both sides of it, the pros, the cons, and obviously that's developmentally appropriate over time. And if you don't know what that is, that's why it's important to seek professional help. Like Absolutely. talk to a therapist, read a book. Like um, you know, there's a lot of good resources we'll give at the end about talking about that, but. One of the other things that I think people are surprised by is that it's something like 80% of reduction rate of sexual abuse if a child uses the proper terms too. Because as a perpetrator, if you're an adult or you're an older kid who's probably been sexually abused yourself and you're looking, you're a predator, you're looking for a kid to abuse Mm -hmm. and you're looking for someone who is not going to catch you. Right, who's not going to tell on you? Who's who? You're going to be able to do it repetitively with, or you're going to be able to get get to do it and get away with it. If they go, if you go up to a kid and they say, "Well, that's my ho ho or my tallywhacker or my whatever," then you already know they're not real with it. Mm-hmm. Right? They don't really know if they don't have any terms for it, or they don't know what safe touch or what. It, they already know that. They know the victims. But if your kid's like, "No, you can't touch my penis," they're out. Yeah. Right. Most of the time, the large majority of, of, you know, abusers are going to go, oh, this kid knows a lot. He knows the right terms. That means his parents are, you know, with it. He's going to tell somebody that I touched him. Mm-hmm. So I'm not doing it. I'll yeah. find another victim. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's a twisted thing to talk about. But that's the reality is that, you know, these people who have been sexually abused, who have this view of children who are going to hurt them. They're looking. They're not looking for the kid who's educated, right. who's talked about it, who's knowledgeable about it, who feels empowered which is the whole point of us talking to kids about sexuality is to give them all the information they can to be empowered to feel responsible for their body you know one thing um is a simple thing but with grady you know he you know there's been several times where he's he's doing something he'll run get away from me and i'll grab him and i'll try to get him to listen to me and and uh and and that was early on and we started doing these books uh about boundaries and about your body and how nobody can do anything with your body but but you and and I was like so I had done that a couple times and I had to incorporate that I was like okay I'm not going to grab you and turn you around I'm not going to pull you out of your bed because I can't say this in one hand and then even if I'm not hurting you move you I need you to move out I need you to be responsible because you don't have a lot of control over anything but you have complete control over who touches you and where they touch you and uh, my mom, we have the penis rules of what we call it, and we have two boys. So, you know, Grady knows who can touch his penis, who can see his penis, when they can touch it, that mommy and daddy can only touch it when they're cleaning him and getting a bath. And now we're getting to the point where he's doing that himself, you know. And my mom came over, this is a couple months ago, and she comes out of the bathroom laughing, and I'm like, what's up? And she's like, only your kid. And I'm like, what? And she's like, he kicked me out of the bathroom. And I was like, why? And she's like, he said, you can't see my penis. I got a TT, Right. 
that's the other thing, right? He knew penis and TT were separate things. Mm -hmm. But if you call it TT, then I got a TT with my T. It gets so confusing. It and does. so my mom's like laughing because she got, and she, I could tell she was a little like offended because she was just trying to help him. Um, but then she was like, no, I appreciate it. And I'm like, right, you don't need to be in there. Mm -hmm. He can stand and pee and pull his pants back up. Like, you don't need to be seeing his penis. It was funny that you say all this. So I have a granddaughter and she's three, Miss Ruby. And we were um, at their house a while back and she and I were playing on the floor and um, I scooted up to her and she said, you're in my space. Nice. And I said, oh, thank you for telling me that. I was so excited because I knew her mom and dad uh -huh. had uh, you know, spoken to boundaries and body safety. And I just, I congratulated you. Thank you so much for letting me know I was in your space. I'm going to back up a little bit. And so that's what she wants. So if you're wondering, can a three year old get it? Yes, they can. Because <laughs> no, she can. was uh, absolutely able to get it. So, you know, we want to make sure that our children are as safe as possible. And we have to lessen our own fear and just go through with it. And be able to to speak to what is out there. Um, you know, you brought up, are they going to have sex if I talk about sex? They're already thinking about sex. You know, another thing, too, is masturbation. We, especially in the South, heavy um, on the spiritual side a lot of times, it's, ooh, we don't talk about masturbation. But it's reality. It feels good. It's, you know, that person wants to explore their bodies. You know, uh, we know that children will even do this in utero. So it's out there don't ignore it but i think what we have to do is we help the child put boundaries around it and you're not sinning on there and yeah. we just have to make sure that in our minds we're not putting shame associated with all these things yeah it's hard because you know when people get into sin and, uh, and literally every time i do a talk on sexuality because I'll, I'll i'll talk about not watching porn and pornography and you know masturbation and all these things um, and somebody will always raise their hand and say, well, is masturbation a sin? And, you know, and I'm like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know 100 percent because it would have to be the person, the yeah, situation. Like, you know, if if you're an adult. Right. And you're married and you're hiding it. Yeah. The sin isn't necessarily the biological mechanism of masturbation. And I think that's where the that's where that's the great. shame alleviates comes, because, yeah, three year olds, four year olds, they masturbate. I just had a client this morning was saying the same thing, like my little girl's reaching in her pants all the time. What do I do? people's own shame of their own issues then they shame them and slap their hand and that's gross and don't do that and that's only going to make the kid do it in private it's only going to keep make the kid start being secretive with it and then what happens is is what's called splitting psychologically right this is in our sex addiction world you have somebody who has all this sexual neglect their parents never talked to them about masturbation pornography none of these things they start exploring with it the first experience they ever have of talking about it or getting caught is met with shame you're gross this is terrible don't do it that's sinful they start hiding it and so their internal self and their external self start to be two different people mm. and their their brain they're able to do these things in private go to church and be this totally separate person and over time that's how people become addicted to these things where they they have secret lives where we don't tell each other anything where we don't talk about what we like sexually where we don't talk about you know what's underneath all these things and then somebody gets busted or somebody cheats or somebody has an affair or becomes a, addicted to pornography or whatever and we're like oh what a horrible person but like it was created because it was the opposite of what God wants us to do. Mm -hmm. They they did not get the experience that Christ called for them to have. They did mm -hmm. not get the education and the support. And so the whole point of me bringing this up with us is to alleviate everybody's shame out there and mm -hmm. to go, hey, listen, I know listening to this right now that anybody who's listening to it, 99% of them are going, yeah, that's me. That's my childhood. I didn't get that either. And that led to a bunch of dysfunction in your own life sexually and emotionally, which then leads to you not wanting to talk to your kid about it, not wanting to say the word penis, not wanting to talk about sexuality, and not leaning into the uncomfortableness of that because it's bringing up your own shame and your own trauma, mm -hmm. you know, your own abuse, whatever that is. And so I know this is a heavy talk for parents and people to listen to, but I think it's super important. Absolutely. The other thing, and you can speak to this as a woman, I can't, you know, I hear women all the time talk about the menstruation conversation and how traumatic you know, not talking, their, their mom's not telling them about like mm -hmm. starting their cycle. And then all of a sudden they're at a swim meet or they're at a, mm -hmm. a sleepover mm -hmm. and they start bleeding and they have this moment and there's so much shame 
and there's so much anxiety and their parent doesn't, they fumble it and don't handle it well. And so now, you know, their vagina has a negative, you know, view in their head and their internal self has a negative view and they're dirty. And, and so I don't know if that's been, you know, an experience you can speak to or not, but with clients or. I haven't had it with clients, but I was that person. Right. So, you know, uh, my mom. Oh, well, I'm going to call you out. <laughs> So my my mom grew up in an era where you don't um, talk about these things. Mm-hmm. Um, she was 41 when she had me, so I was a surprise. But, you know, <laughs> so as we go along, I mean, I think it was 24, 25 before I ever had a conversation um, with her on it. It was because I had a basic question, didn't know what something was, right? But it was like, do I talk to her about it? Do I not talk to her about it? Mm-hmm. So it was the same thing. I mean, you know, luckily for, for me, it wasn't an embarrassing situation, but absolutely. But that goes back to really what are you why are you not wanting to talk to your child about it so we have to explore that why in the parent what is shameful inside of you that feels like you can't talk to this about your child i mean uh, to your child and so you know the more information you can have them and you used a great word a minute ago you empower them so you are not harming them you are not scaring them you're actually empowering them so when you tell a female this is what your body's going to go through and this is what you can expect and i'm here and available for you and you have questions um that opens a whole new avenue for that child to be able to explore you know uh for women i think it's a little bit harder because yes it can happen anywhere at any point in time and we don't have control over that mm-hmm. so it can be embarrassing how do we deal with that but it feels more empowering if i know what's happening inside of my body and that i can address that or i can talk to somebody about it and not feel like it's shameful and I'm all by myself in this. Oh yeah, that's good. I mean, I think that for boys, it would be the, the erection conversation because that can happen a lot of times mm-hmm. when you're not planning on it, Yeah. especially as a kid with hormones and everything going on and, and you're walking around and your dad makes fun or your mom says something. That is the, I want people to understand that all the things that we see in culture and we'll get to cuties and all that in just a second, but all these things that we see that are super inappropriate, they all stem from early childhood trauma, neglect, abuse, you know, of some adult being shamed about their sexual, you know, sexuality. Um, And even if it is like a trans issue or homosexual issue, and we won't get into, you know, all that, but it's still the same root causes. And if you address that, there's a way to address that appropriately and inappropriately that's going to make it way worse. or It's going to make it, you know, it's going to shame that kid. And, you, you know, in those areas where you really feel like it's outside of your scope and you don't know what to do, man, seek help. Have somebody else have that conversation with you and with your kid. You know, ask the right questions, you know, have somebody there that can, uh, you know, that can listen with a non-biased opinion that's not all in in it emotionally, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever your views are on those things, because the kid needs to be taken care of, you know, Mm -hmm. especially within, you know, the trans and homosexuality, you know, with kids dealing with that, struggling with that, however you want to view it they need just as much support as anybody else, if not more because of the culture. And so before jumping to saying something that, you know, is shameful, you know, bring them somewhere to get supported, to be heard, to be walked through, and then you can figure out what to do with it. Absolutely. And I mentioned earlier about four reasons for behavior, the last one being display of inadequacy. So I'm not good enough. I'll never make it. This is horrible. Um, I'm never going to have a good day, those kind of things. And so what we have to remember too is our words have power Mm -hmm. and our words can either produce healing or they can produce harm. Um, and so sometimes we think, oh, well, we'll just make a joke about this. We'll just laugh it off. Really what we do in that moment is we dismiss the child. Oh, absolutely. And so we need to make sure if they're coming to you about the sexual uh, nature of things that take them seriously, affirm them, validate them. At least they're coming to you and not trying to find it on the world by web, you know, or going to a friend who has some kind of jacked up view of things they are coming to you and so celebrate that but don't embarrass them don't brush it off don't make joke of it because eventually they'll go well you're not going to take me seriously anyway i'm not coming to you about anything else oh for sure and it can put a shameful thought in that neural pathway and that's the one thing we don't want to have to unwind yeah and we've talked a lot about shame so i just want to clarify shame is you know different than guilt guilt is what i'm doing is wrong i don't like it and it's not who i want to be mm-hmm. shame is you're not good you're individually broken you're uniquely broken yeah so just for people listening you know we we, we want people we want children to feel a sense of guilt and change and i don't want to be this way we don't want them to feel in and of themselves bad yes you know we want them to see their behavior as 
you know, not helpful and not the best, you know, version of themselves because they are God's kid. They right. are worthy. They are loved. They mm-hmm. are unique, mm-hmm. you know, and I think sometimes we mix that up. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about QD just for a second. So I think not only, you know, kind of painting that picture of sexual neglect, I want, you know, people have to understand that to understand how a thing like Cuties can get produced. So Cuties is a film on Netflix where, you know, somebody produced this film. They're trying to show, I mean, in the whole picture, they're trying to show that the extreme religious culture and the over-sexualized culture are both terrible and they're killing our kids. Mm -hmm. Like, that was kind of the goal. Mm -hmm. But because it's coming from a secular view, they use children to Mm -hmm. communicate this. They filmed children... Um, in sexually provocative positions and images doing what children in the world are doing but unfortunately they use minors to do this Mm -hmm. and as we know minors can't consent to that type of behavior so even if they said yes there's no like a lot of people have compared it to uh, well don't you know you canceled your Netflix but there's all these other sexually provocative shows why wouldn't you cancel it for that well those are consenting adults Mm -hmm. you might not want to watch it but there's nothing to stand up against because they consented to act that way, perform that way, do whatever. Even with pornography, like they consent to some degree. There's a lot to say about that with coercion and trafficking, and you know, and you can listen to our first podcast to hear about that. But the reality is, is legally, they can consent to that, even if it's terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, but a child can't, and so that's kind of where I think cuties went off the rails big time. Was the the problem I have with it for a culture is that you see this huge pushback from adults canceling Netflix, calling it out, but we forget that we are part of that culture and enable the you know the hypersexuality of children. We let our little girls put on makeup at three and go do a dance and wear provocative clothing. You know, at Betty Virginia Park, I've seen you know the dance line from so and so's dance academy. And they're dancing to some hip hop song that's talking about sexuality while they're, you know, doing very provocative moves. And I feel super uncomfortable, but there's 50 adults standing around watching it. And so there's a lot to, you know, and again, that's not shaming people who have their kid in dance. It's just we need to be aware of how much we feed into that culture and where our boundaries are with that. But because we have this history of neglect and sexual neglect and sexual trauma and all these things. I think we have blinders as adults in our culture that we don't realize that we kind of play into the situation to where a secular person filmmaker makes a movie, you know, to try to fight this battle, but they do it in a way because we as the church, we as Christians, we're not giving another option. Mm -hmm. We're not showing how to be consistent. We're kind of falling into the same traps um, again, and instead of trying to blame people, right, let's look at our own lives and, and, you know, hopefully listen to more podcasts and read more books like this that help us to just, you know what, I'm going to just do things different in my family. I'm going to have better boundaries. We're going to have better conversations so that my kid's safe, so that the kids that I engage with are safe, um, and so on and so forth. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll say when you first brought that to my attention that the video, I think it was probably about a month ago that you mm-hmm. brought it to me, and you just showed me the uh, well, poster. Well, that was what's funny, right? We we started talking about it here a month and a half ago when it first came out, and then, you know, I'd been upset about it for that long, and then it got popular on Twitter or whatever when it actually came onto Netflix. So, yeah, it's, it's funny. And I just remember looking at that poster and being sad, mm-hmm. heartbroken. Because I'm working with babies in my office that have been touched inappropriately, Mm -hmm. who have had sexual abuse, who don't even understand, um, because they've had sexual abuse, the beauty of of sexual um, things. And so to know that somebody permitted these children to be in this movie and that they are not even really being introduced to the beauty of all that it is. And so I think it's just heartbreaking to me to even know that that's, that that's out there. Um, you know, cuties, I get, and I get what they were trying to do, but again, leaning back on what you said is that it still wasn't okay. There's a million different ways that that could have been done. Yeah, for sure. I mean, make a documentary. There's enough pictures and video and evidence of child child exploitation and over-sexualized children that are, are that's already been produced. Exactly. So that's just as shocking to see. Mm-hmm. But to, to do it live, one thing I thought about, and I, I'd written some stuff on social media about it, but then afterwards I was like, oh, man, I didn't think about this. But the, um, you know, all the the people who came in who wanted to be in the movie, 
like how many little girls had to sit in front of the directors and the people and, and perform those, you know, scenes to see if they could make it in the film. You know, I didn't even think about, it. I mean, how many cast, you know, casting directors had to sit there and, and tell little girls, Hey, do this, do that, spread your legs, touch your vagina, you know, suck your finger, do these really hypersexual things in order to prove a point because someone had to direct them to do it. Mm -hmm. So I don't care what the reasons are and justifications. That part of it is too much and too far mm -hmm. and abusive and, and pornographic for children. Absolutely. Um, and there's really no arguing that part. Mm -hmm. You can definitely get into the debate and say, well, and I think that's the, the secular world's fight against it to, to affirm it is they're trying to affirm the right thing. This is terrible. And this is already what our kids are going through. And that's, what's sad is that, on on our on the Christian side, it's like, well, we should be putting out more material in a good way to speak to this, more podcasts, more movies, more more talks. But because we're not now, the world's so desperate, they're producing things, and these things are broken. Mm -hmm. So if they're if they're not coming from a Holy Spirit, Christ centered, you know, direction, they're always going to have some. And even when we try to do it, we botch it. I mean, we're we're flawed human beings. Absolutely. But when the world's bringing it to our attention. Um, it's kind of like the same thing with uh, the social dilemma, mm -hmm. which is on Netflix and talks about you know technology and Facebook and Instagram and and this whole world of manipulation that our children are also becoming victim to in a in a big way. And we need a whole podcast on that. But again, it's the secular world. There was never an answer. There was never this is how we're going to change it. This is what we need to do. And we as the church, you know, we as mental health Christians who are mental health, like that's why we're doing this is to give people that other to bridge the gap between the church world and the secular world exactly. when it comes to mental health and trauma and how do we do this practically? Mm -hmm. You know, yes, I need Jesus. Yes. I need to read my Bible, but like where in the Bible does it tell me to talk to my kid about masturbation? Right. Like where does it tell me to talk to my kid about menstruation? Like how do I practically do that? And so, you know, I appreciate you coming on today and us being able to kind of dialogue and give people some specific ways to do that. Um, we got a little bit more time. Uh, one thing can, that yeah, can I ahead. just mention sure, something real quick? Uh, Bonner Group, who is a Christian organization that does um, what am I trying to say? Statistic surveys within the church. Mm -hmm. um, just put out. I say just put out. It's probably been about about three or four weeks. A packet, if you will, on trauma in America. And I was reading through it for some other stuff and, it, and the statistics are just crazy. But what I love that they did was they did apply the church perspective, you know, and then, you know, they surveyed not just the church, but they surveyed people who aren't in the church mm -hmm. and people who are non-Christians and so forth. And they culminated this. One of the things they said in there and, and rightfully say this, that we don't have an answer to it necessarily, but that, you know, a lot of clergy, a lot of um, pastors, they don't know how to deal with the mental health side of things. Oh, for sure. They don't know how to deal with sexual abuse when it comes in their office. They don't know how to deal with emotional neglect when it comes in their office. So, you know, uh, the church is often the first line of defense for many people. I'm thankful for the churches that are recognizing, I don't have a skill set. Yeah, we, and, get, we and, get a lot of referrals from churches and pastors yes. that realize that they're out of their scope. And, but I think what the church does have to say is how do we get the skills yeah, and to deal with this? That's great. And and for people who don't know, we, we have a program called For the One here at Clint Davis Counseling where we get we, are, we go in and we train in the church on being first responders to trauma, to abuse, to sexuality, to have these conversations. So, you know, if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, my church, I need to do this, like, we'd love to come in as a team and teach your leaders and your pastors and you as parents how to do this, how to break it down practically um, and help you to walk through like your B groups, your Sunday schools, your, your discipleship groups, mm -hmm. your, you know, your staff meetings and, and how to be more trauma informed when you're dealing with the culture and with your children. And, and I think if we do that, it's our only way out of this, you know, this mm -hmm. debacle that we find ourselves in with over sexuality and trauma and, um, and it's only getting worse. I mean, right. because of technology and social media, you know, kids are just so different. They're so wired differently. They're so much more compulsive. They're so much more addicted. They're so much more susceptible to all the problems of the world. And we're not really giving them too much, you know, answers as adults because right. we've transitioned now into this kind of, we went from analog to digital. Like I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have social media and I'm almost 40 and because I do this and we keep up with it and talk, I can address it. But as a 40 year old who didn't, 
sometimes you forget what you don't know. Right. You know, and you think that kids are just, you know, doing the same things and, mm-hmm. and that's not the case. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, last thing is, is talking about what are some resources. So you mentioned you give your website. Yes. Um, so it's on a Google site. So it has one of those really weird things um but we will have it attached to the facebook page um as well as our uh main page Uh i'll link it on the podcast too and the youtube channel yeah um on there and so i will have that because it's like ww google site so it's too much to remember on here (laughs) but i will have that and there are free resources but Uh, that's through northwest play therapy is that what it yes okay well this one is not actually it's just a whole separate website where i just upload free resources nice nice as I find them. So there's things for ministers on there. There's things for uh, parents, um, other therapists. I mean, it's completely a uh, free resource. Northwest Louisiana Play Therapy Training is the one where um, other therapists seeking out uh, wanting their RPT, their registered play therapy license, or just to know more of how to engage children and implement play therapy, they can go there to find out about some of the trainings. Okay. Um, another resource I want to talk about was uh, God Made All of Me. It's a book. Um, it's really good. It takes children through. Uh, it, you can read it to your kids. Um, I was going to read it on here, but apparently, you know, with copyrights, can't do that. So, you know, it takes you through what is a private part, who can touch it, who can't. Uh, one of the things I really love is it talks about secrets versus surprises. Yes. You know, and just starting really early, we don't keep secrets. We don't keep secrets from each other. You know, what's a secret? Why would somebody try to, you know, keep a secret from you? Who can touch you? Who can't? And it's a con- the the di- the as you read it, it's a dialogue between the kids and the adults. Mm. So mm-hmm. you're reading to your kid the dialogue, and then there's questions with it, um, and it's super helpful. And I I read it once, probably once a week to to my kids. Um, and then the other is good pictures, bad pictures. So there's a junior, and then there's just a regular one, and that takes them through um, pornography. And doesn't use the word pornography in the junior. You can. It has a little tab for it. But it basically takes you through, like, where, you know, where what are good pictures? Good mm-hmm. pictures are kitty cats and boats and these things. And, and where can you find them? You can find them on screens and on the wall and in magazines. And, and what are bad pictures? Well, bad pictures are, like, picture poison. They hurt your brain. Mm-hmm. They change the way you, you know, you think. Um, and these are these are things that are of people's private parts. And so what are private parts? That's anything underneath a swimsuit. And, you know, it goes through a very descriptive but very friendly kid way of doing it so that they can start to understand the concept of these things. And it, it says if you ever see a pri- if you ever see a bad picture, you're to close your eyes, cover your eyes, turn and run and tell. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I have my kids practice that, you know, and um, they'll cover their eyes, they'll turn, they'll run and they tell an adult. And so. You know, it starts them really early at three and four, learning and having context for what happens if I get on the laptop or I get on the computer or I'm on television or something's happening and there's pornography or, you know, something that makes me feel uncomfortable. Number one, this is what you do. This is who you come and tell. Mm -hmm. It's okay to feel uncomfortable. It's it's empowering for you to have control over it instead of um, feeling like, oh my gosh, what is this? Should I feel bad about it? I kind of like that. That's a wrap. Like all of that happens and then, you know, they keep it a secret and it becomes a major problem. So those are two really good recommendations that I would give um, that I think are super helpful. And there's more and we'll put them, you know, we'll put some tags on the. I'm going to piggyback off a a good picture, bad picture. I had an opportunity to hear the author uh, speak at a conference and she actually started that website because her neighbor or started that book and and she has a website as well. But her neighbor came to her and said, I just found pornography on my kid's phone Mm. and I have no idea how to talk to him. And you used to be a teacher. (laughs) That's how it got started. And she said, you know, I realized as I was doing this and helping this parent that there are other parents out there that probably have the same fear. So she has a website that, and I think you can search Project Young Minds. Um, I think it's just www.projectyoungminds.com, but you can search that. It'll come up with it. She has free resources on her page as well. Yeah, I, I think parents need to really realize when it comes to technology, and like I said, we need to cover that on a whole other podcast, but when it comes to technology, the stats are that 84% of parents have no rules for devices, mm-hmm. which means if you're even if you're doing it, you have to be very careful with the kids that you let your kids hang out with mm-hmm. that are unsupervised because... 84% of their parents are not doing it. Right. So, you know, more than eight out of 10 of the kids at your kid's school, 
their parents aren't talking to them about these things. There's no monitoring. They can take their iPad or their, their tablet or their whatever. You know, my, we, we got my kid broke his arm last week. They show up at the doctor or at Shriners to get the cast on and they walk in and, and the doctor just hands him an iPad and says, here, you want to play on this while we, um, you know, fix your cast. They didn't ask us if he could do it. They didn't ask, you know, I don't know if there's, and there's certainly not any like covenant eyes or any things on there. Um, and so, you know, it, that the technology, the access, the affordability, the lack of accountability, those things are killing our children. Mm -hmm. And when I say killing, um, I was reading Jonathan Hyatt's book. Um, I can't remember the name of it right now. Oh, the coddling of the American mind. And it's, and he actually speaks on, um, on that movie, uh, that we talked about earlier, the social dilemma, but you know, the self harm rate for teenage girls from the ages of 10 to 14 has increased 200% wow. and the suicide rate has increased 170% in 10 to 14 year old girls. Um, you know, 95% of boys have seen pornography by 14 and their early viewing of pornography is eight, mm. right? That's the new normal mm -hmm. for kids to view porn and that's boys and girls. Um, I think 37% of teenage girls are watching pornography regularly now when it used to be like 6%. Mm -hmm. You know, because we as parents forget that they have so much access that, that we don't know they're doing. And if you, if you think of this whole conversation in the sexual neglect realm, like it is a recipe for disaster mm -hmm. because you're not talking about it. They've already engaged in it. So by the time they're eight, you haven't talked to them about rules. You haven't talked to them about boundaries. You haven't talked to them about any of these things that we're saying. And then they go to school, they get a kid's phone, somebody shows them a video and you know, they're excited by it. They're aroused by it. They go home on your tablet. They look it up and they're smart. They know how to delete the history. They know how to figure out how not to be on there. And then you insert allowing them to have social media or allowing them to have a, a Instagram account. And we're, you know, we're getting into the more like preteen teenage years but that parallels with all the suicide rate, all the self-harm, all the over-sexualization is younger kids being able to be on technology without supervision or just have an, you know, a social media account in general. Um, and so if parents are listening, we're going to do another podcast on that. But there's a lot of good you know, the resources um, that we're going to be bringing and how to do that. And that just has to be a conversation with our homes because that's not going to change, you know, and that's getting worse and worse and worse as kids early exposure to pornography abuse. And they're not just getting exposed to like two people having sex. Like that's bad enough for a kid to see they're being exposed to violence and aggression and they're, they're forming the way they're aroused and the way that they view sexuality and the things that turn them on with things that are violent and aggressive. Mm -hmm. And that's just really the first time in human history that we've seen this. So, you know, parents have to be, you know, y'all have to be, we have to be on top of that. We have to supervise our kids. We have to monitor their devices. Um, and we have to talk to them about these things that we've talked about today. And I'd even say, you know, to the, to those that are addicted, who are adults, who are addicted to pornography and who are hiding it, um, be, be careful little eyes what you see, yeah. because I've had more probably within the last month and a half people come in and go oh he found it on my mm -hmm. uncle's phone he found it on his daddy's phone and so now he's looking at it on his personal laptop so you know get help because we want you to be the healthiest version of yourself for your children oh for sure and it only takes once i mean mm -hmm. you know it's everywhere it's, it's on everywhere. everything and and like the social dilemma talks about it markets specifically to you so you know i've had stuff on my phone come up and i'm like where is this coming from and why is this being advertised to me and if if my son walks in and he's looking next to me it's like he can see that mm -hmm. and that and if we don't discuss it and we haven't discussed it then he learns a lesson mm -hmm. this is what daddy likes it might be something that i don't even like right it might not even be sexual but if we're not communicating with the situation, then they're learning lessons and they're figuring out from us. It can be the same way on the other side where, you know, it's how you engage on social media as a parent. Mm -hmm. If you're on your phone all the time, if your kid's constantly saying, hey, mom, can you put your phone down? Hey, dad, can you put your phone down? Hey, can you come engage with me? It's such a easy thing to get sucked into. Mm -hmm. um, but then while you're on your phone and you're on social media or you're looking something up or you're on your work email, you know, they're over there doing whatever and they're learning how to use a device from you. Mm -hmm. And so again, there's a lot more to say and we can go into it for a long time, but um, any closing thoughts for you or any points that you really wanted to get across as a play therapist or 
Sure. So one of the other things that I would just say is just remember that um, we cannot ask of others what we're not willing to do ourselves. So if we're asking our children to be um, X, Y, and Z, are we being X, Y, and Z? We're going to be that model for them. And, you know, as a parent, know that we here at Clint Davis Counseling, I think I could attest for every therapist here, we recognize you're trying. Um, And we want to just help you to be the best version of yourself that you you can be for the sake of your children so that they can, you know, rise up and be the children of God that God has called them. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah, And I'd say to close on my end, when we say the church isn't doing anything, what I mean is, is we're all including in that Mm -hmm. the body of Christ. Like we all are individually responsible to learn and grow and make our family the healthiest version to minister, to be able to heal so we can go out and help the world to dying. Yeah. Because as bad as we're struggling with this, you know, we're still in a framework of having the Holy Spirit and having community and having some, you know, moral, yeah. you know. Yep. Yep. The center. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was like, you can't <laughs> whisper. You're on here. Uh, so, yeah. So, we have to do something. So, part of our goal, yeah, to, to mention that is we are – um, next year opening uh, a family and children's center that Perry's going to be the director of. So we're going to have several play therapists underneath her. We're going to have some more ABAs who work with autism and Asperger's. We're going to have a sensory room, a dance studio, some art therapy and sand tray rooms um, so that we can really minister to parents. We're going to have a big educational spot so we can do parenting seminars, parenting classes. Um, and we're going to do some of those for free for the community. Some of those will be paid depending on what we're doing. Um, some retreats, you know, so that we as a practice can incorporate all that we do into the children of of tomorrow and the parents of today. Because if we don't, you know, real shortly, it's, it's going to be downhill quickly because these kids and these parents are the last, like we're the last ditch effort outside of technology to figure out how to do this right, how to deal with trauma, how to deal with, you know, Facebook and social media. And, and if we don't get a, get a hold of it, then you know, we're lost. Yeah, we've got to ask ourselves continually, how are we a part of the solution? Yeah. We're good at pointing out the problem. Yeah, for sure. But we got to be a part of the solution. Well, I appreciate you, Perry, and this was awesome, and I hope that parents get a lot out of it. And, uh, yeah, again, Perry's great. We have um, Kelsey and Andrea um, who are here and who can do play therapy, and, um, you know, we're going to keep growing that, that area so that we can help kiddos and help parents. And, you know, we just see it as a holistic thing as, as – a community of people coming together and really just trying to work and and have a non-judgmental stance that you're not judged you're not going to be criticized for messing up you know we're going to totally understand and say hey i've been there too um but let's do this together and not just use that as an excuse to to stop yeah, you know being better absolutely and sam is our aba therapist and uh, she's great with working with those kids she'll be an encourager to those parents as well so as a whole that's encourage one another just as scripture tells us to do absolutely all right well god bless you guys thank you perry for coming on here and uh go uh subscribe to our page and get more information all right